Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition came out last Thursday, and in this video, I thought we'd take a look at what the biggest changes are. The change log is extremely thorough. It's over 25,000 words in total, which to put into perspective for the average reader would take about two hours to get through if reading for comprehension. If that sounds like the greatest two hours of your life or there's something specific that you wanna read more about, there's a link to the change log below. For this video though, I've done the reading for you and I'll be summarizing what I think are the most important parts. To start with, if you've been following news about AoE 3, then you'd know there are two new civilizations. One is the Inca, which AoE 2 players will recognize as a jack of all trade civilization with an emphasis on stone defenses, and a lot of that applies here as well. In AoE 3, they have a unique building called the Concha House, which passively generates a trickle of food and gives 12 population space, though you are limited in the number you can make. In the Commerce Age, you can also use it once to ship four extra villagers to your town. They also have a building called the Tambo, which is a special type of trading post, supporting population, and can garrison villagers, adding to its attack. They can also create a unique scout unit called a Chasky that can build more Tambos. Their elite unit training building is the Kalanka, which has the special ability to garrison units and reduce how much they count towards your population. You can garrison units in them and go over your population limit by essentially hiding them from the game and then releasing them after more units are queued up. Of course, after they come out, you have to fall below your max cap before you can train additional ones. There's a limit to three of these buildings at any one time for sort of obvious reasons. And finally, they have a unique stronghold that can also garrison units to increase its attack. You get the sense they're a very building focused and defensive civilization. Now I find their units take a bit of getting used to. Their jungle bowmen, for example, have poison damage, and their anti-building, quote, artillery is the Huarako, which doesn't look like normal artillery, but does quite a bit of siege damage. They also have priestesses that can heal friendly and convert enemy units, as well as work at the community plaza, where you can add villagers, llamas, and priestesses to give benefits to your economy or military. Options include stuff like faster work rate, spawning new units, or generating a trickle of wood. There's a lot of overlap there with Aztecs in that regard if you're familiar with them. The other new civilization is the Swedes. As you'd expect, they're in some ways quite similar to other European civilizations, but with no skirmisher or dragoon, and instead rely on the saloon to create mercenaries. Their unique building is the Torp, which replaces the house and automatically gathers nearby resources through a multicolored aura that collects at half the speed of a settler. Any dead animals, trees, crates, and up to one berry bush or mine nearby are automatically collected from, and it also spawns its own berry bush beside it. My favorite feature is it can also do a bit of hunting of nearby animals as well. Now the resources they're collecting do eventually run out and you have a limit of 20 that you can make at any one time while destroying them gives 48 experience to your opponent. So there's a few factors to weigh about where they're placed and when you move them. Important units to note for the Swedes are the Carolians, which are musketeers that do 30% more damage to cavalry with their ranged attack, fire quickly, and are stronger in melee combat, as well as their leather cannon available in the Commerce Age. It's described as light, affordable, and good against infantry, and is their alternative to skirmishers. They also have a unique replacement for dragoons against other cavalry and artillery. Until you can get some of your strongest units out, Sweden is intended to rely more heavily on their mercenaries through shipments and at the saloon. The intention here isn't to give a full guide on how to play the new civs, but hopefully that at least gives you a broad idea of what's new and unique about them. Now let's take a look at some more general changes. Immediately on first playing the game, you get to choose which UI you want, between the classic AoE 3 layout, the definitive layout, meaning more similar to Age 1 and 2, as well as the new default layout. Of course, this is also something you can change in the options between games. Personally, I like the default layout the best already, as it keeps all of the important information on the right side of the screen. There's also a lot more customization for hotkeys now. You can put idle villagers on tab, for example, and use extra mouse buttons to select town centers, which it wouldn't let me do in the original AoE 3. You can also switch between their new default hotkeys that follow a grid system, or switch to the legacy hotkeys you'd know from Age 3. I appreciate that it allows for conflicts, but will star potential issues where you have multiple actions bound to the same key. It doesn't force you to resolve those, and if you don't think it's going to be an issue, you can just leave it that way. While on the topic of improved options, they also have a really cool accessibility tab, I would think intended to help people with colorblindness, but it's also a great feature on its own. Basically, it lets you customize player colors, though I'm not going to lie, this has already led to some confusion online, where my color for player 5 might be different than somebody else's but I'm still a big fan of the option and it's extremely intuitive to figure out how to use. 
Another change, and in fact the very first thing you see when you start the game, is a note about representation, especially of North American tribes. There have been a few renamings, like Sioux to Lakota, Iroquois to Haudenosaunee, Discovery to Exploration Age, Colonial to Commerce Age, and the Fire Pit is now the Community Plaza. Various flags were also changed for historical reasons, all of it to make the civilizations more historically accurate, as well as reflect how the zeitgeist around colonialism has changed since 2005. A lot of these don't impact gameplay except for one new mechanic. After bringing on a First Nations consultant, they decided the mining of coin for First Nations civs was too inaccurate, and now instead they have a tribal marketplace. Essentially, you build it for 25 wood next to a coin deposit, and you can put up to 10 villagers on it. It then depletes the gold at the usual rate, though you start with the first coin gathering upgrade research to offset the 25 wood cost. It seems like it was going to be controversial whether they decided to change things or not, and for me it's a respectful way to compromise historical accuracy with playability. The next section of the changelog is about unit changes and balance. Right away an interesting one for naval combat is that ships no longer fire at random intervals. They now fire at a predictable rate, though they say the overall rate of fire is unchanged. Inaccuracy has also been removed, and naval units can also move in formations now. Grenadiers also got a bit of an overhaul as well, with a new grenade launcher card, allowing grenadiers to be created at the artillery foundry of all European civilizations in the Third Age, and increases their range and fire rate. They had a few other minor tweaks as well, which you're welcome to take a look at. Another change is what was previously called Light Infantry, including Coyote Runners and Eagle Runner Knights, are now called Shock Infantry to differentiate them from Skirmishers and Crossbows, which are commonly referred to as Light Infantry. Various units had changes to their cost, stats, or train time, and I won't bore you by reading all of the details. The most dramatic change to me looked like the healing rate of surgeons and field hospitals going way up. Native warriors were also improved basically across the board. In general, their stats went up significantly, though they now have longer training times to offset that. Just keep in mind native warriors are going to pack a bit more punch than they did before, which I think is a good thing, as otherwise it's easy to get tunnel vision playing your own civilization if you're not properly incentivized to do otherwise. The map pool was also expanded. Besides some updates for competitive balance, 22 new user-created maps were added, along with some new map sets to keep things organized. The consulate for Indians, Chinese, and Japanese also had quite a few tweaks for balance. Expeditionary forces were made stronger to encourage saving up for expensive armies, and are now more standardized to give the same value worth of units. In H3, the expeditionary forces are all now worth roughly 1400 resources, and in H4 they're all in the ballpark of 3000. As you'd expect, there was also a ton of changes to the home city shipment cards. Considering it's a lot of stuff like the 5 spies card increased to 6, I'm obviously not going to go through it and bore you with the full list. Notable ones to me are that the Medicine card now decreases the cost of villagers by 15% on top of their faster training speed while no longer affecting fishing boats. Covered Wagon cards also increase the Town Center build limit, though I get the sense booming on multiple Town Centers is less critical in Age of Empires 3 than it is in Age of Empires 2. Advanced Artillery was moved from Age 4 to 3 and allows for Mortars and Horse Artillery in the Fortress Age. I'm not saying these are the most significant for experienced players, but they jumped out to me and get me immediately thinking about strategic implications. Of course, I have to add it's now way easier to get information about cards in-game. Before Definitive Edition, I found the in-game explanations gave me very little context for what things did. Anyone who's played the game probably won't need an example, but take Reclaimed Land and Flooded Parcel, which have the exact same description. The first one can be sent in the first stage, and the other can be sent in the second, but there's no indication there's anything different about them. Both of them ship a rice paddy and increase gather rate on them by some unspecified amount. In Definitive Edition, the exact stats are clearly displayed, and it turns out one increases gather rate by 5%, and the other by 8%. That's an important piece of information, and even better, Tears Tills in Age 3 is plus 10%. Finally, you can make informed decisions while deck building, without looking things up on a wiki or resorting to pre-built meta decks. I think the fact things are way more upfront now means you don't necessarily have to dive into the changelog for card changes. It's kind of the same story when it comes to a list of all of the balance changes. There's obviously a ton of info thrown in there, both general and specific to each civilization. To highlight what looked like the most significant to me coming from the Asian dynasties, and keeping in mind I'm not that great at the game, we have the town center cost is reduced from 600 to 500 wood, wall HP was cut in half from 3000 to 1500, fishing boats cost was dropped from 100 wood to 70, trading post income decreased by 15%, and churches now provide a passive 0.6 XP per second trickle. 
From what I can tell, the changes are almost identical, if not completely identical, to the fan-driven ESOC patch balance changes. If you're going to do balance changes for a definitive edition, mimicking those seems like the best way to get the competitive AoE3 community on board, considering the years of discussion and balance testing that has already gone into them. For Civilization-specific changes, the ones that jumped out to me are the French Thoroughbred shipment no longer decreases the train time of Queer Seers, on top of a nerf to the Mass Cavalry card. Japanese Shrines got cheaper, and their home shipment for Daimyo and Shoguns to boost their unit training rate now has half the effect. The Lakota, previously called the Sioux, looks stronger in basically every way, and Russians got even better at shipping excessive numbers of units. A ton of treaty and deathmatch changes were implemented, as well as some general bug fixes. Things like looking at your opponent's deck to see what shipments have been sent, and many, many other small things have been addressed. It's not to say every single bug is fixed, but it's an impressive looking list. Treasures also got a huge balance overhaul, and sure, looks good to me. First impression is it looks like they were going for more consistency. Two wolves used to guard both 60 and 90 food treasures, and both of those were changed to 70 and 75 for example. At the end of the day, treasures are still a random element of the game, and some people are going to love that and some people won't, but it's something that's still in there. Overall, I'd say they stuck to the core mechanics of Age of Empires 3 without rocking the boat too much. Now we need to talk about a game mechanic that isn't new, but heavily expanded in Definitive Edition, called Revolutions. Traditionally, it's something you could do instead of going up to the 5th age, but was an all-in strategy replacing your settlers with colonial militia and having just a few options for cards to send from your home city. No more building and resource collection means you had one big push left to try to win the game, and if that wasn't successful, then you were probably going to lose. It seems like it was added as a dramatic game-ending feature, one way or the other. This has been overhauled to make it more viable, and now as you're revolting against your home country, you have a lot of new nations you can pick from. You also get a much more fully fleshed out home city and deck. Ottomans and Portuguese, for example, can become the Barbary states, unlocking privateers and turning all settlers into Barbary warriors. All of your cards until the end of the game are also replaced with much more aggressive ones. As another example, British and French can now revolt to become Canada, where settlers gain 13 attack, but can still be trained. British, French, Dutch, and Swedes can also have a revolution to become the United States, which get a fort wagon and improved Gatling guns. In their case, villagers do become military units, and Minutemen no longer lose HP over time, while also being recruitable from forts. In the case of Finland, their settlers turn into skirmishers, but can still gather from trees, and any new skirmishes you make only cost wood. In total, you have 16 nations to pick from, though your choice is limited to a subset in any one game, depending on your civilization. The revolutions still stick with the concept of being an alternative to advancing to the last age, but more focused on military. Each unit has to be learned individually, and of course, if you prefer, you can just go to the fifth age like normal. I think it's a cool way to quietly add a bunch of new civilizations in there, but without having to completely make them from scratch. There are also eight new politicians, which are the bonuses that you get while aging up. They're generally one-time bonuses, and if you're relatively new to a particular civilization, the changes probably won't mean that much to you, since you likely won't know which ones are new. I'm not going to go through all of them as they straight up tell you what they do as you advance, but just so you know, there's a bit of new content and rebalancing there. In terms of multiplayer, I have experienced a bit of lag, but it's definitely more than playable for me online. In fact, for a multiplayer perspective, I think it might be the smoothest Age of Empires release. There's a ranked and unranked system, with the ranked play giving you an elo rating and a place on the rating ladder. The unranked lobby is a little glitchy, with the scroll automatically sending you back to the top every second or two, which I recall also being an issue in Age of Empires 2 HD at one point after a patch. Stuff like that doesn't bug me too much, since I know it is going to get fixed. During at least the first few days, the lobby has been pretty bumping with games, and obviously there's a lot of excitement for the new release. There's even a new spectator feature, though I found a lot of games were unavailable more often than not, and I'm not really sure what that's about. There's also a return of the Art of War tutorials on various aspects of the game, from home city shipments to naval battles and artillery. So those are all the changes in the official change log. It might partly be due to all the small unit and treasure changes, but it seems to be quite a bit bigger than Age 2 Definitive Edition. That said, there are a few criticisms worth bringing up. The first is reports of performance issues. There's already been a hotfix and bugs are being tracked, Generally, I haven't seen a lot of it, though there is the occasional stutter, and zooming all the way out, things do look blurry on a 1080 monitor. I think AOE 2 handled this a bit better with a sharpen option, and also the enhanced graphics pack for higher resolution, meaning people could self-select what their computer could handle. 
I've read that turning down the foliage level in AoE 3 can help, so it's worth a try, but no question it's a more demanding game than AoE 2 Definitive Edition. Hopefully it'll get some optimization to run a bit easier, especially for people with lower end setups. Another thing to know is the home deck is still there and there's no way to turn it off, but all cards are unlocked both in single and multiplayer. Hardcore AoE 3 fans are used to leveling it up, or just as commonly editing the game files themselves to get around this. At the moment, leveling up your home city unlocks customization options for European civilizations, and maybe that helps give a sense of progression when you're playing lots of games. Online, it also says what level your home city is, which gives a snapshot of your experience level with that civilization. I have to say as well, the scenario editor is exactly how I remember it. It can handle triggers, add units, and create maps, but it looks identical to me, and there were no updates mentioned in the changelog. So hopefully that gives you a reasonable overview of what to expect from Definitive Edition. It's a lot more than a simple reskin of the old game, and if AoE 2 DE is anything to go by, issues with release date, performance, and bugs should see an improvement over time. That's all for this one though, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.